Our next presenter, are you here? Well, it's been a great success story, actually, for the livestock advisory industry. Now, Bridie uh, started out at um, Murdoch Uni, and then, I don't know if she went somewhere before Mount Barker, but I met her down in Mount Barker. Rex said I should have a chat to her. So, um, and Bridie came into the office, and we spent a bit of time going through some benchmarking and talking about advising, and and I suggested she might think about the bursary for this, and she applied for it and presented excellently here. And then the next thing I know, she's she's finished up at the Mount Barker vet, and she's gone home to work on the farm and and try and evaluate her life and things, and has ended up working as a livestock advisor. So, I think I think I think that's my responsibility for that. So that's great. I'll take it. <laughs> so welcome, Bridie. And Bridie's going to be talking about scale worms and the impact. Of That's not what I'd written down as my bio, just so you all know. <laughs> Okie doke, cool. Thanks so much for having me along. Um, I appreciate the offer to, to give this speech. Definitely surprised. There's a few faces in the room, including some of my lecturers, who I think would probably be better at it, but anyway. Um, yeah, so a big topic, scale worm management, mainly through drenching, was kind of the focus of today's talk um, for both cattle and sheep. So a lot to get through in 35 minutes. So I've really tried to focus on, I guess... The practical aspects of what I use in my day-to-day because, -day, um, yeah, I find that's the most relevant for everyone. And um, there are a few slides in your notes that um, I won't have in here, but that's just for your reference. So um, just a quick agenda. I'll talk about the worms of importance and the life cycle very briefly. Um, and then my main three things I'm going to talk about is how to decide when to drench, um, the antel minty options that we've got, and sort of a, a rough resistance outlook for WA, um, which is, I think is important to know. And then thirdly, how to decide what to use once you've decided you are going to drench. Um, then in the last couple of slides, you know, I'll touch on the non-chemical management side and some info on where you guys can get some um, more info for your clients. Okie doke. So I've also got little emojis in the corner because I'm going to be jumping from cattle to sheep, so um, keep an eye on that. In terms of sheep, our main um, scale worms that we're talking about in today's session will be the small brown stomach worm, the black scale worm and barber's pole worm, and to a lesser extent, um, nematodirus, which is more of an issue in lambs rather than um, adult sheep. In the cattle space, um, we've got our small intestinal worm, which is Caperia, so often um, making up a, a large contribution to our worm egg counts, but not necessarily um, causing the primary disease, usually causing the other um, worms that are present to be more potent or to have a more potent effect. Um, then we've got a small brown stomach worm for cattle, which is a different, different worm. Um, and we've also got another barber's pole worm for cattle, which is, again, different to the sheep side of things. And to a lesser extent, we've got the stomach hair worm, which is Trichostrongolus, and then also um, the nodule worm. In terms of crossover, I thought it was interesting to look at, um, you know, if you're co-grazing or um, grazing them after one another. The main one would be Trichostrongus axii, so the stomach hair worm, which is predominantly a cattle roundworm, but it's also going to infect goats, sheep and horses, so something to think about. Black scour worm, um, predominantly sheep roundworm, can rapidly infect um, calves, but the infection doesn't usually persist, so we don't usually see it in adult cattle. And then barber's pole worm, we've got Homonchus contortus, which is our sheep barber's pole, and then Homonchus plasii, which is our cattle barber's pole, and they can affect one another. Um, and sheep are more susceptible to the cattle um, species. So I've said I'm time poor and I'm going to focus more on sheep. Um, the major reason for that is arguably worm control and scour management is more important in sheep because of the implications that it has for um, the risk and the incidence of fly strike and also the fact that sheep have a lower propensity to develop immunity to worms. So I'm briefly touching on the life cycle. Number one, got no time. Number two, it's boring. Everyone knows about it. But basically, I think the major things um, to take away in terms of management, I think this might be broken, oh, is um, when we're looking down, obviously, eggs are coming out in the faeces, they're going on the pasture, and the eggs have got to hatch. Um, and there's ideal temperature ranges for that and ideal moisture um, ranges as well. Most worms will be between 10 to 18 degrees and around that 60% moisture. And then when we get to the other end, on the third um, 
the third uh, stage larvae, which is the infective larvae, that one actually migrates out of the faeces and goes onto the pasture and they can't feed. So whatever energy reserves they have at that point is um, what they've got to get them through to until they're eaten. And in warmer temperatures, um, they have higher activity, so they will die more rapidly. And that, yeah, I guess is a, a good focus point for how we manage our strategic trenches. Another, um, I guess, Part of the life cycle which I want to highlight was hypobiosis. So basically, obviously means hibernation. And this is a, a worm survival mechanism, to put it simply. Um, basically, the worms will um, arrest that, well, some of the larvae, I should say, will arrest their development um, in the lining of the gut. Um, and the reason for that is when the environmental conditions aren't conducive to their eggs and larvae surviving out in the environment. So they can do that for extended periods of time and then re-emerge when environmental conditions are better. And the way they figure that out is um, they can tell by what feeds coming through the gastrointestinal tract, which is pretty amazing, I think. In terms of sheep, um, all roundworms can do it to a certain extent, except for the black scale worm. Um, and for cattle, we have to be particularly um, aware of the small brown stomach worm. So we can get type 2 ostatagiosis. I never know how to say that word. Um, we see it less often now, but this is when um, we're getting uh, a huge mass of those larvae erupting from um, the gut lining at the same time. So often we can see that in our younger cattle in that sort of later summer, early autumn period, when um, conditions are starting to be a little bit more conducive to their eggs and larvae surviving on the pasture. And as you can see with this photo here, um, this is a heifer that's died from um, type 2 osteogenesis, and often it'll be in that pre-carving phase where they've got a lot of stress going on. Anyway, moving right along. Okay, section, I guess, important um, point number one would be when to drench. And we'll start off looking at sheep and use them as a comparison. So in terms of um, deciding, you know, looking at a mob of animals and going, when are we going to drench them? I think, you know, we want to ideally assess and test each individual situation and stay away from a really calendar-based, you know, it's November the 20th, we're going to drench the whole property um, situation. Um, however, there are some strategies that do, I guess, you know, ring true year on year. And they would be what, I, you know, we call our strategic drenches. And, and they're most, um, I guess, they're mostly based around what we know about um, larval survival on the pasture, which is why I've got this really basic graph here. But obviously, after the autumn break, um, we've got some moisture. Temperatures are still quite temperate. And we get a real rise in um, larval survival on the pasture. And obviously, that declines as we go into summer, which is kind of the classic um, environment for WA. So... The first four questions I always ask is, are they lambs at weaning? Are they used pre-lambing? Are they lambs or hoggets in early summer? Or are they new to the property? And the reasons being is that these underpin the strategic times to drench for sheep. First of all, lambs, we know that they are our most susceptible cohort to worms and even a, even a low burden is going to impact um, not necessarily clinical disease, but it's going to impact how well they perform post-weaning and combined with the fact that they're going through that very stressful period, um, being separated from their mum, they are extremely susceptible. So in almost every single situation, despite what the worm egg count says, um, I'm going to say drench at weaning time for lambs. For ewes, as I'm sure many of you know, um, when they're coming up to that lambing period and about um, a month or so into their lactation, they have a drop in their, um, in their immunity to worms. So they become more susceptible and they also um, start spitting out more eggs and that has implications for partial contamination, which of course is going to down the track impact, um, I guess, the risks for their lambs in terms of um, becoming burdened with worms. So we often focus on that drench in the medium to high rainfall areas because we want to preempt a really large larval population over um, winter. The third point, so that was question three, which would be, um, you know, are they lambs or hoggets going uh, in early summer? And that brings us back to the summer-autumn drenching, um, I guess, paradigm, which in WA we used to drench in summer a lot. Um, and we've since smartened up a bit and figured out that that is really perpetuating drench resistance. And the reason for that is because when you think about 
Um, it's to do with refugia, which I'll talk a little bit about later. But basically, when you give a drench to a sheep, a certain proportion of that of those worms are going to be resistant to that drench. Um, and so they are the ones that are going to survive in that animal over the summer period and then be the worms that are spitting out their eggs to populate our autumn and winter pastures. And because over that summer period we haven't had any larvae um, surviving, well, I shouldn't say any, but we haven't had many larvae surviving on the pasture, over here we've got a very resistant population. There's no susceptible larvae to... Um, I guess, dilute those resistant worms. So that's why we focus on only drenching lambs and hoggets as we're going into that um, summer period when the pasture dries off before they're going onto their crop stubble. Um, obviously, they're still at that young age. They've got a low immunity to worms, so we want to focus on them and try and push back our um, adult animals until autumn so that they can carry through that susceptible um, cohort of worms and also so that we can, um, I guess, um, make the most of the fact that it's early in the season and we can try and reduce um, any further worm contamination or, um, you know, into the winter period. Then number four, any new stock to the property should be getting a quarantine drench, um, you know, in every situation. It, you know, we go through all of these mechanisms to try and slow drench resistance on our property. So why would we just go and buy it in? Um, doesn't make any sense to me. But anyway, um, for sheep, ideally we want four different actives in that drench. Um, and if you can, a good, uh, I guess, a good management strategy after that is leaving them in those yards or in that paddock for three to four days. Um, afterwards, they can spit out um, any eggs that were already there um, and or you can... Um, spell that, that paddock afterwards as well. So they are, I guess, the main, you know, calendar-based, when are we going to drench type questions that I ask. And then any other times of the year, of course, we want to know, um, we want to know a bit about the stock, the age, the class, etc. What time of year is it? You know, are you in Kellerberon or, or are you in Manjimup? That's going to make a difference to your decision. And then, of course, clinical signs tell us a lot and our worm egg counts and larval diffs are great diagnostics tools as well. So obviously, scouring, weight loss, poor growth, death after a few weeks um, can indicate our scour worms and sudden death, anemia, bottle jaw, lethargy um, can be more indicative of barber's pole worm. Um, you know, in WA, I guess when you've got lambs, well, you know, animals less than 12 months of age that are scouring, it's almost always worms until proven otherwise. Um, we do need to be aware, though, of um, what they call hypersensitivity, which occurs in adult sheep. Um, and they've developed their immunity to worms, but it's actually an allergic reaction to the incoming larvae at the beginning of the season, usually. So after that sort of dry, hot summer, they're starting to get um, larvae coming back into their system, and they have this reaction, and it causes scarring. So it looks like worms, but they won't respond to a drench. So that's something to consider in your decision-making. We all know worm egg counts and, you know, there's plenty of us in the room that do them and see them done. Um, making sure our clients are testing each mob individually, not just doing one mob to represent the whole property. I think I try and get people to focus on starting their worm egg, you know, their serious worm egg counting in autumn or at least four weeks after that initial break um, and then continuing that through the green season, ideally every four to six weeks, um, obviously that you know, if you give a drench, you don't, you've got to do it four to six weeks after, particularly in the higher rainfall zones. Um, of course, the wheat belt is a little bit of a different situation. And then, um, you know, if you're on the coast, you're down in areas where barber's pole worm is more of a risk, then those guys are going to be the ones that need to keep, you know, vigilantly checking over that summer autumn period. But I would say, particularly in your younger animals, if you are getting any unprecedented, unprecedented rain um, over the summer period, it is worth checking just doing an easy, cheap worm egg count to just make sure that particularly your hoggets are, are still tracking along okay. In terms of looking at eggs per gram and going, you know, what level are we drenching at? Obviously, we want to interpret in the context. Um, so there's not really perfect set boundaries, but there's a few vague rules. In terms of our strategic drenches, so that's back to the weaning, use pre-lambing, our summer autumn drenching, and, you know, we should always do quarantine drench anyway. Um, but in those situations, we're really trying to preempt a high worm burden down the tract. 
So our action levels are a lot lower. So usually in those situations, I tend to sit around that 100 eggs per gram as the, as the lowest. Whereas at other times of the year, you might not necessarily even have clinical signs, but we are trying to preempt production loss. Um, so usually you'll get a drench response in poor conditioned animals um, from about that 200 eggs per gram, well conditioned animals at about 300. And then in terms of barber's pole worm, um, usually our entry level for a drench would be at about 1,000 eggs per gram. And that's more, uh, that's less so to do with the clinical um, disease that the worms are causing to that animal, but to do with the pasture contamination. Um, as we all know, barber's pole worm produce, you know, 10,000 eggs a day or whatever it is. All right, just got a couple of quick examples. So we've got a mob, mob of 450 merino lambs at weaning time, no clinical signs, haven't done a worm at count, and they're out at Tannin. Who's going to drench these ones? Show of hands. Where are they going on to? Huh? They'll be going on to a stubble. Yep, cool. I agree with those who put their hand up. I'm definitely going to drench them. It's, I know we're in tamin, but it's weaning time. Even a low burden um, is going to impact these guys, so we want to clean them out. Mob of 250 ewes at marking time. They've got mild scouring. They were egg count sitting at 40 eggs per gram, and now we're down in cogenut. Who's going to drench? Show of hands. Sweet. I agree. I would retest them in four to six weeks. I think they are showing mild scouring, but, you know, at marking time, um, that could still be a nutritional issue. That could be hypersensitivity. I think the worm egg count's low enough, um, and I haven't listed anything about body condition or score coming off, so I'd retest them in four to six weeks. I think that's safe enough. Okie doke. So all of those principles I've just told you, I pretty much apply to cattle with a few differences. Um, going back to things that are the same, of course, our weaners in cattle are still very susceptible. Our pre-calving animals are very susceptible, particularly heifers and second calvers. Um, we still want to focus on taking that opportunity at the beginning of the season to make sure that we, I guess, knock the worm numbers on the head so that we don't get huge spikes in our pasture contamination over winter. And we do want to quarantine drench as well. Um, but the major differences are, and I'm sure many of you know that Cattle are much less susceptible to worms as adults in comparison to adult sheep. And worm egg counts are still a fantastic, you know, tool in the tool belt to help make decisions for cattle. Um, however, it's, they're only really reliable up till about that 18 months of age. Um, and a low worm egg count for cattle is not necessarily indicative of a low worm burden because of the, their propensity to develop immunity to the worms and they have very good ability to suppress... Um, our egg production, sorry, so it doesn't correlate to the number of worms. So adult cattle rarely have a high worm egg count, meaning, um, you know, if you do get a low one, it's not necessarily reliable. So that's why we put a lot more emphasis on, obviously, clinical signs and things such as body condition score and, and weight monitoring, you know, the likely worminess of the pasture and the age and the class of those stock. And, of course, just being aware in that late summer autumn period of the emergence of those brown stomach worm can be an issue, particularly in your um, pregnant heifers. All right, quick cattle example. Mob of 50 Angus cows, four to six years old. It's May time. They're showing weight loss and scouring. Their worm egg count's five. We're in Margaret River, and it's been an early break. Who's going to drench? We've only got a couple of takers. Oh, a few more. Yep. I would definitely um, consider a drench in this situation. I think we've got older cattle, uh, but they are showing signs of worms. The worm egg count's not necessarily reliable. We're in Margaret River, so pasture contamination is likely to um, be an issue in the winter period in this area. And we've also had an early break, so the worm season has shifted forward. Um, yeah, perfect. Oh, another thing I'd probably say on that is in particularly in four- to six-year-old cows, I would avoid trying to drench the whole mob. Um, if you do have cattle in there, a good, good condition and, and not really showing clinical signs, if you can leave them out, is even better. All right, and then we've got a mob of 100 Murray Gray calves, weaning time, no clinical signs, and a worm egg count of 20 in Denmark. Who's going to drench? Yep, Ash and Dad, I agree with you. 
I'm going to drench them too. They're wieners. Definitely want to drench them. We're in Denmark, so um, obviously conditions are a bit more conducive to larvae surviving over the summer period, so I'll be, I'll be checking them pretty closely as well. Cool. All right, that's the first point done. Everyone's still alive and awake. Good eye. Thanks, Ed. All right, um, I can see him looking at his clock, so I better hurry up. All right. Antiwintic options, um, pretty much. If we look at the different groups, we've got benzimidazoles, the whites and the clears. They're obviously our old groups. We all know that. Um, both cattle and sheep utilise these in their products. The benzimidazoles are good in the fact that they work against the inhibited larvae, um, whereas levamazole doesn't. And benzimidazoles are oversidal, so they'll kill the eggs as well, um, which is handy. We've just got to be careful with levamazole that we can have levamazole toxicity, so making sure our animals are nice and hydrated and getting the right dose is important. Um, the ML group, um, again, they've got a great benefit that they work well against those inhibited larvae, particularly on the cattle side of things. Um, and then we've got our, our Just Sheep um, One's product, sorry, we've got monopantil and dequantil, so they're obviously the newer molecules. Napphalophos is not really used that much um, anymore, but it's in a few combos. And then clisantil obviously just works against, bar against barber's pole. And then nitroxanol in cattle, that's mainly in a combo with um, liver fluke treatments, so we don't really use it over here that much. Drench resistance outlook for WA. So I have to thank Brown Bezier and also Matt Playford from Dorbitz just for their sort of help with this one. Um, in terms of resistance, our benzimidazoles and levamazole, so the, our oldest products, um, have got significant resistance on all farms, which I think we're all pretty aware. And our combinations of these two are re resistant on at least 90% of farms. So um, I know in my you know, my recommendations, I'd never recommend even a combo of these two on their own. In terms of our MLs, we've got um, ivermectin, abamectin and moxidectin. Um, obviously, ivermectin's the oldest one. Again, I avoid it like the plague. Abamectin, we're seeing resistance on up to about 80% of farms, um, sometimes quite severe as well. And I think one thing to note on that, as I'm sure you all know, is just making sure that your cockies aren't relying on abamectin in their lice treatments to knock their worms over. Moxidectin, we're seeing resistance on up to 60% of farms. It's usually not that severe, though, so we're not often getting a less than 70% reduction in our worm egg count, which is good. But it's a part of a lot of our combos. We've obviously got long actings that have got moxie in them as well, so we need to protect that one. The combo of abamectin... BZ and levamazole, or abamectin, BZ and naphthalophos. There's resistance on at least 10% of farms, and it's not usually severe, so not often less than 90%. And our moxie, BZ, levamazole combos, as well as Startex, Zolvix and Clisantil, there's not any confirmed resistance um, at this stage, to my knowledge. And, of course, this uh, resistance outlook is probably lower in the wheat belt, but we still do have resistance in the wheat belt and we need to be aware that it is a high, uh, I guess, resistance selection area because the summers are even, even hotter and drier, so we're not getting any survival. In the cattle space, um, caperia, so that was the one that's often very prevalent, is resistant to you know, all types of MLs to, do, to varying levels. There's some BZ resistance, but it's still pretty good with levamazole. Our brown stomach worm... Um, there's some BZ and levamazole resistance and possibly ML resistance, but that's more of a postulation. Trichostrongylus axii has some reported BZ um, resistance as well. So moving on to the last major point would be Rado. So we've decided we're going to drench. We sort of know the... We know our options. We know the disease um, outlook, I guess, for WA. How are we going to decide what to use? The number one major factor is using an effective drench for that exact property, which is, I think, where so many of our clients um, stuff up, I guess. No one really wants to do drench resistance testing, um, and it, it is the number one thing that's going to slow down drench resistance on your property, and, you know, that's a limited number of molecules that we have in the sheep game, so we really need to try and get them onto that. I'll talk a little bit more about that next. Um, I also like to obviously look at worm egg count and larval diff results because obviously we have a worm egg count that's five, ten thousand. 10,000. We know that we're probably going to need to chuck placental in there because there's probably some barber's pole worm going on. 
And the same principle, a larval diff is going to tell you what worms you've got there. So if you look in the cattle space, if you've got 65% of um, that worm out count is made up of caperia, you're probably going to want to be using a combination, not just relying on M uh, MLs because there is resistance. The third one, um, using combinations of two or more drench groups. You know, we've done this one to death. We all know it. There's uh, less, they're less likely, the worms are less likely to be resistant to two different actives than they are to one. Short acting, we should be using short acting um, unless we really, really can't, and I'll talk more about that. And then, obviously, read the label. So with drench resistance testing, again, like banging on about it, but no one wants to do it takes work, it's a bit costly, but um, it is really the best way for us to test the effectiveness of different actives on that property because I've given you that outlook, but it can differ so much from one farm to the other just depending on what they've done before. So ideally every um, two to three years, um, obviously, you know, between autumn and spring so that we're getting worm egg counts high enough and in animals that are less than one year old and ideally haven't had a drench. Um, and an even line, and pretty much what we're doing there is focusing on that worm egg count reduction test. So we're getting worm egg counts prior, worm egg counts 40 days later, and doing larval diffs and figuring out the percentage reduction. And ideally, we want those actives to kill um, at least 95%, and ideally 98 A good little one to do in between that is your drench checks, which is where you know, you're doing your normal worm egg count, you give the drench, and then 14 days later, do another worm egg count, and that's going to, it should be about zero, the eggs per gram, um, and it's going to give you an indication of whether those products are still working on your property. In terms of long acting, um, they can be fantastic. They can be very effective at long term suppression of the incoming larvae. However, they obviously come at a dollar and an effort cost, and they do increase drench resistance. Um, so we should be avoiding long actings unless we really can't manage the situation without with a short acting strategy. And some of the reasons I've listed up there for um, you know, why we would use long acting options might be the high stocking rate, really high stocking rates and high pasture contamination, pre-lambing in our high rainfall zones and um, also our barber's pole risk areas. And just a little note that you know, there's little use in, cattles over, in cattle over 15 uh, to 18 months of age. So if you then decide that you're going to, um, you know, it's, a, it's appropriate, you're going to use one, there's a few things you can do to be a bit more responsible about that and, you know, increase the longevity of that molecule in your property. And that includes our primers and tail cutter drenches. So I'm sure most know, but for those that don't, primer is just another drench that's from separate groups. It's a short acting and it's ideally a combo that's given at the same time as the long acting to basically clean out those animals. And then the tail cutter is given when the persistence of that product is dwindling. And the way that we um, determine that is by doing worm egg counts throughout the persistence period. Because, you know, for example, Dynamax in sheep, its label is 100 days, but if you have got resistance to those molecules on your property, it's not going to last that long. So by doing a worm egg count, you can figure out when your worms are jumping up you know, above, uh, the eggs, sorry, are up above that 100 eggs per gram stage, and that's usually where I'd come in and do a tail cutter. Right, just to be clear, it's obviously there's uh, the mectin, right, yep. the injectable, yep. and we've got the capsules, and you're recommending for both of those that you do a, an intro and a tail cutter. Yeah, it's the same principle, yeah, yeah. That's why, and the tail cutter, you know, if you you know, your farm's amazing and the protection's going out to 100 days, then you're probably not going to need to do it. But in the situations where you're coming up short and you're getting a higher worm egg count, let's say at marking time or after that, then, yeah, I'd go in. Um, so I just did a quick another example. Um, so 100 pregnant ewes, three weeks out from lambing. They're a mid-July drop. We're in Manji. They're already scouring. They've got their body condition score is two and a half out of five. Not too bad, but not the best. Um, and worm egg count of 420 eggs per gram. We don't have any drench resistance data, which is the normal situation. And their last drench was in late May. So this is less of an audience one, but in this situation, I would say a long-acting option is appropriate to consider. Um, obviously, we want to make sure... Ideally, if you can worm egg count every month, it would be great, but particularly for the sheep guys, if they at least do it 14 days later and then when they bring in the ewes for marking, 
I think that's appropriate. And I just chucked up this um, table just to kind of, I guess, make the point of out of these different long-acting options that I've just put up here, um, the primer and the tail cutter ideally want to be from a complete different um, group and also a different molecule. So something to consider there and, and planning, pre-planning for that. And obviously if you can have drench resistance results before you go into this would be ideal. All right, last little point. Um, I've spoken probably a little bit about refugia through the talk, but haven't really defined it, so I thought I'd better quickly do that. Obviously, refugia means in refuge, so the aim is that we're avoiding all of the worm population, and by that I mean the, uh, you know, the worms in the sheep and also the eggs and the larvae on the pasture. We want to avoid that whole population being exposed to drench at the same time because that subjects them to drench resistance at the same time. And ideally, we want to keep a proportion of that population um, free and in refuge to the drench so that they can dilute those resistant worms later on. And I think a good way of thinking about it is in sort of a green temperate environment. You know, there's lots of um, egg and larvae survival in the pasture. So um, if you drench the animals, it's very easy to maintain refugia because there's a, there's a high pasture contamination. Whereas in, you know, the summer in um, Kelleberan and nothing's living on the, on the floor, on the ground, um, it's, it's hard to maintain refugia. So that's why, you know, I sort of banged on about um, avoiding summer drenching in adult sheep. I've touched slightly on targeting treatments. So, for example, if you had to give, you know, adult ewes a drench over summer for whatever reason, if you can, leaving out sort of 10 to 20% is going to help maintain refugia. Of course, you know, leaving out the ones that are in good condition and not showing size, you, don't, you know, don't want to kill them. Um, and then the last one, yeah, just... Obviously, after we wean lambs and often when we're putting ewes on a lambing paddock, we're putting them on a low-risk worm pasture, which is great. But when we're moving, um, I guess if we're doing that process on every mob at every point in the year, you're actually uh, speeding up drench resistance because it's, it's the same principle. There's, there's low um, larval contamination on that pasture, so any resistant worms that come out aren't being as diluted. So, you know, at other times of the year, moving adult sheep onto um, low-risk pastures, doing it um, one week earlier, which I know is a pain. Um, so I just put this slide up. I'm not going to go into these because I sort of didn't get asked to talk about um, the non-chemical management, and I don't have time. But just to make the point, <laughs> just to make the point that, um, you know, we can drench to a blue in the face, but we need to be doing, you know, our integrated pest management and making sure we're hitting it at all angles. So... Um, there's a few references for you guys that I often go to, and I'm sure you already know all of those ones. Um, so, yeah, we basically the major things are, you know, looking at those strategic drenches and making sure that we're monitoring throughout the year using our clinical signs and our worm egg counts. And then I think the best thing to do is, like, having cheat sheets of what products are available. I find those who don't have that, they just tend to always recommend the same thing because they know it. Um, so that's a really handy, um, handy thing to do. Awesome. All done. Yeah, so the um, FEC pack, it's called. Um, yeah, so pretty much this is a machine that, I mean, I don't know anything about the company and stuff behind it, but pretty much I think it's through Dorbutt's lab, who are over in New South Wales, and Techion, which is um, New Zealand. And basically um, there's still a procedure to prepare the sample, but it sort of takes out the variability of the um, person who's interpreting it. So what happens is you basically put it into a cassette and it gets an image is taken and that image is sent away. It actually goes to NZ and is interpreted. They, they count it from those pictures that you send and they pretty much get you a response within 24 hours as well. So um, there is definitely still a, a process beforehand. It's not immediately perfect, you know, it doesn't take five minutes, but it's a lot less labour intensive um, than actually doing it with a microscope, I think, and particularly if you're, you know, maybe wanting to do them do them yourself or it's not like your perfect area of expertise, it's sort of, you don't have to know how to interpret them. The yeah. issue is, 
Yep. Yeah, it is really good. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, it's sort of an advantage for us has been putting them in locations where there isn't necessarily a worm counting. Um, what's the word? No one's doing it. Yeah, there isn't a resource to do that, so it's been very handy for that. Yeah. Trench resistance testing. Mm -hmm. So, the grenade resistance testing. Do you do it for that? For that handbook, do many of the locations that you do it? Not really. I'm even only doing this one where it counts in the state, so all the nutrients came out of the school school. Yeah, yep. So, and it's a tricky one. Like, Bron and I were just looking at the costings of it the other day. It sort of ends up being around like 450 to 500 bucks per active to do the whole thing, you know, if you're including your drench and your larval diffs and blah, blah, blah. Um, so a lot of the cases are where, like, drug companies are doing trials and such and you try and get clients in on that because it can be quite expensive. Um, but I'm not trying to say don't do it, but it is, like, I get why people don't want to jump at it. Not that, no, I don't think Deeper does it anymore. So that's sort of where it's been lacking a little bit. But, yeah, it's definitely, like, I know Ella does it and Bron and I do as well, so, and Shanae. Excellent. Um, long acting injectable. Mm -hmm. um, does uh, does it affect black worms the same way? Like brown stomach worm, black scale. Black scales a bit shorter. Oh, that's a label job, Ed. I don't know that off the top of my head. Um, Bron might. Like you're talking about, like a Moximax or Cydactin. Yeah. Like yeah. yeah you, there you go. Oh, Carol. It's 42, isn't it? One of them's 42. Yeah, do worm egg counts and actually see where you're at. Mm. Yeah, just um, just to the side, it's the guy for a lot of clients who use in a high rainfall area. You're not Cut you don't think that drenches are really or worms a big issue. You see a, some sheep that have been uh, captured, and you see a couple that haven't been captured in that lot, and it's tells it just a big story. Uh, I suppose if you're looking at our gross margins now, you know around sixty five dollars a DSC, multiply that by ten or whatever it is. Uh, compared to 25 a long time ago, it's only four dollars a pop. It's uh, three dollars fifty a pop. You can see it's usually management, but also you know, managing worms is a lot of us. You know, so it's a free kick, really. Mm. You can really do more production, of it, especially in those environments. How do you do? The last thing is um, just for a lot of the confinement that's going on around the state in different areas. We're finding that that's reducing the impact of worms. So through confining the break of the season seems to be uh, yeah. Breaking the cycle, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. I guess you kind of, um, particularly if you're confinement feeding use over that autumn period, you're pretty much just extending your summer. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, thought we'd um, have a lot bigger issue with worms this year, but I don't. It's been so cold, so I'm wondering if yeah. you're going to explode in the next. We've had like quite summer. a few, I guess, on our and lots of reports of, uh, I would say, production loss or just not doing as well. Yeah. yeah. And I would attest a lot of that to worms. Yeah. Oh. Right, fantastic. No Thank you very much.